Hey everyone, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, and today I have a very special interview for you. He's a very talented and experienced limb lengthening and deformity reconstruction surgeon at the Institute of Orthopedics and Rheumatology at the Mediclinic Winelands Orthopedic Hospital in Stellenbosch, South Africa. Please enjoy the interview with Dr. Franz Burkholz. All right, everyone, today we have a very special guest joining us. He is a member of the Institute of Orthopedics and Rheumatology at the Mediclinic Winelands Orthopedic Hospital in Stellenbosch, South Africa. With over 20 years of experience specializing in correcting leg length discrepancies and complex deformities, he also helps boost the height of his patients seeking cosmetic stature lengthening. With a passion for technology that transforms his patients' problems into happiness, please join me in welcoming world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Franz Burkholz. Dr. B, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Hey, good and, good and you. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. I mean, I always like to meet new surgeons from around the world, especially in South Africa. In fact, just the other day, somebody emailed me about you in particular. So I'm glad to have you a part of the, the community. Um, now, before we get into your surgical approaches uh, you know, to limb lengthening, I want to mention a few of your quali qualifications for prospective patients. So you hail from a family of doctors. You earned your medical degree from the University of Pretoria in 1997. During residency, you, di you dived into complex trauma surgery, mastering well -known external the well-known external fixator frame, the Elizarov, qualifying as an orthopedic surgeon in 2006 with a master's of medicine from the uni University of Pretoria. As one of the more experienced surgeons in limb lengthening and deformity reconstruction, you have performed over 3,000 Elizarov ring fixator frames and implanted several internal nails during your tenure. With credentials, definitely make your patients feel safe in your care. And now we're going to dive into the world of limb lengthening. So Dr. B, how did you get interested in the field of limb lengthening and deformity reconstruction? Take us back. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends on how much time you have. I can keep you busy for a week. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, where do you want to start? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, I think, I think it, it, it's basically uh, when I started or when I was a resident in orthopedics, I spent a lot of time in the field of complex trauma. And I realized that the standard orthopedic uh, techniques were not adequate to treat all the aspects um, of complex trauma that we see, especially the complications like the infections, the bone loss, the non-unions and so on. And I soon realized that we need different tools. And that's when I sort of came across the Elizarov method. And uh, just a correction earlier, you said I mastered it. I definitely haven't mastered it, but I have done a lot of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so I del delved into that and into the work of, of Ilazarov and the Bastiani and Paley and all the big names out there and, and realized that here is a technique or a technology or a, or a set of techniques really that can help us help our patients better. And over the years, I then um, developed my, my skill in this field and by borrowing and learning from other surgeons, I could um, eventually expand my own knowledge and experience to the level that I can help um, patients that require this, this very specialized uh, set of techniques. Absolutely. And that you have, I know we had conversations earlier about all of your, you know, experience in the field, but also you like to dive into academic research about limb lengthening and about your craft. How important is it for an orthopedic surgeon in your discipline to, you know, kind of align the academic research and what's, you know, happening in the OR? How do you kind of align both of those? Yeah, I think it's critically important. I think um, at at the core, uh, 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 orthopedic surgeon that's at the pinnacle of his his or her career um, is both an artist and a scientist, and and we have to match those two um, aspects of our craft uh, in a way. Uh, the art part comes in with experience and with uh, a bit of flair and a bit of out of the box thinking, but the research part or the science part comes from research. And, and unless we measure what we do, and unless we measure patients' outcomes, we don't really know that what we're doing is the correct thing. Right. So I believe it's critically important. Now, what is very difficult to do sometimes is to balance your time spent on, on these two. You get guys who write papers all the time, but they do very little clinical work. And you get guys that operate all the time, but they don't really get time to do research. So I probably fall more in the latter component of the spectrum where I tend to spend most of my time on clinical work. Mm -hmm. And I do spend some time on research, not nearly enough, but I do believe it's critically important to have that balance 
uh, in our field somehow. Absolutely. Very good. Uh, now, Dr. Burkholz, where is your practice practice located in South Africa? Is it because I know you mentioned you Pretoria and Stellenbosch, but for patients who are actually looking to find a limb lengthening surgeon in that part of the globe, where exactly are you located? Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question. Again, with a complex and long answer. Um, to put it simply, I'm in transition at the moment, and I am um, moving my practice or a part of my practice over to the Stellenbosch area uh, for a variety of reasons. But one of them being that I'm joining the or I have joined the Institute of Orthopedics and Rheumatology which is a specialist institute located in a beautiful part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we have high level um, um, multidisciplinary team involved. We have um, an excellent hospital. So the, the nursing care, everything is, is top notch. So from a patient's perspective, I believe that we're giving a very high end product by aligning ourselves with that hospital. Having said that, I have many years and the vast majority of my time I've spent in Pretoria and I still run a very busy practice there. And we, uh, of course, have our partners there and our multidisciplinary teams and our hospitals that we're aligned with. So we still do a lot of work there. But I think if we're looking to the future and somebody wants to sort of start research, researching, having the surgery with me, it would be beneficial to look at the Stellenbosch option because that's likely going to be the long-term option. Um, if a patient presents with a leg length discrepancy of, say, four centimeters with, you know, a malunion along their lower tibia, would you prefer to use the typical Ilizarov fixator or an internal lengthening now? And if you do go with the external fixator, how long would they need to wear it before removal? Or does it depend on the patient case? Yeah, I think that's a very good uh, case example that could show you a surgeon's thought process. And I'm sure that's why you selected this case yes. <laughs> uh, because it's not as simple as it sounds. Right. Um, it's the tibia is a problematic bone. It's a bone that when it uh, does break, it gives us all kinds of problems. If it heals, it often heals with a malunion and it heals in a short uh, position like the case you explained. Yep. But very often together with that, there is a deformity. And it's, it's very seldom that you would have a purely length problem in this instance. You would often have a slight malalignment as well. And to take that into consideration, one needs to, or, or, or to plan this case properly, one needs to take that into consideration. But in broad terms, uh, for a tibia, I would choose external fixation. Mm -hmm. I would probably not use an Elizarov device in its purest form. I would use a derivative of that in the form of a hexapod circular external fixator, which gives us the advantage of doing advanced planning and correction using uh, computer software. Um, the... Uh, Getting into the technical details, the tibia broke at the bottom and the malunion is at the bottom of the tibia, yeah. um, but the length discrepancy is best addressed at the top of the tibia. So uh, if it's a pure length discrepancy, the osteotomy would be at the top and you would have a fibular osteotomy together with that and you would do a simple lengthening. Okay. More often than not, one can address some of the alignment issues through that same osteotomy. Mm -hmm. Very occasionally, the deformity might be so bad distally that you would need a second osteotomy at the bottom yeah. to actually correct that. The problem with that then is that you can't add length there yeah. uh, reliably. Yeah. So you would then have to have a proximal osteotomy for length and a distal one for realignment. So right. it gets complex very quickly. And, and this is where it's important to have a surgeon that has seen these things and done these things yeah. uh, to be able to anticipate what could potentially go wrong and what are the best ways to solve this. To circle back to your initial question, how long the fixator would have to be on, the equation is actually very simple. It's about one and a half months for every centimeter of length gained um, in the average adult population. Um, so that would mean about six months in the fixator. I normally add another month or two when I'm counseling my patients just to make sure that if things go a bit slower, that we're still in that ballpark. So I would tell a patient six to nine months, uh, give or take, um, and that should give us a relatively reliable and accurate answer. Now, regarding cosmetic stature lengthening patients who want to get taller, what is your thoughts on safe lengthening limits? Because we know that each bone segment kind of has like a, a threshold where things start to get really tight. And a lot of patients want to kind of shoot for that max length because they want to, you know, get their money's worth and, you know, get as tall as they can. You as a surgeon who's been doing this for years, what are your thoughts on for the, the femurs and then the tibias as well? Yeah, I think, um, again, the, the answer 
is more complex than it seems at face value. I think if we, we want a pragmatic, easy answer, then in my mind, the safe limit for a femur is about six and a half centimeters, and a safe limit for a tibia is probably about four, four and a half centimeters. Um, I have no idea what that is in inches, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm metrically trained, so, uh, so so my brain doesn't think in inches, but uh, but realistically, that's about the limits that that are, if you ask me what is safe, that is what is safe in my mind. Now, the majority of patients that come and see me have the opportunity to do a lengthening once. They don't don't have the opportunity to come back for a second set of lengthening, uh, whether it's from work perspectives or. Um, just simply the travel or the cost. Uh, so if you had to ch choose one single lengthening and you can only afford one single lengthening, I would shoot for internal female lengthenings and then push that limit a little bit upwards of that maximum and see if we can get to maybe seven or eight. But we know, and the patient also knows when I have this discussion with them, that we are pushing the envelope. And there is a chance that we might not get there that we will only get to about six or six and a half. Now, is there, is there a threshold that you've seen that where complications are more common for each of these bone segments? Because I know that people say that beyond, you know, at other clinics in the world, they use a lot of the external fixators where they can kind of go beyond that eight centimeter max with a lot of the internal lengthening nails. You as a surgeon, how, where is that, that threshold that you say, hey, look, there's going to be a definite complication, you know, that can happen there um, for the femur or the tibia. So patients can really hear it from an expert like yourself. Yeah, I think what makes it difficult is it's so individual and it's so dependent on the starting height, the starting length of the, of, of the limb, the flexibility of the soft tissues, you know, all of these things uh, come into play. The issue is not the bone. We can lengthen bone almost unlimited as long as the fixation doesn't uh, fall apart. Uh, the issue is the soft issue and, and specifically the tendons and the nerves, um, because those are the ones that limit us generally. Um, also, it's not a clear cut cutoff where we say up to this point it's safe and then beyond that it becomes unsafe. It's almost a, a curve that runs and then becomes vertical at some point where, where the complication rate accelerates, you know, almost like an exponential curve. So in my mind, you know, in a femur up to about six, we're relatively safe. In a tibia, probably about three and a half, three point eight, somewhere around there, uh, you're still on the flat part of the curve, and then it starts tapering up. And in certain individuals, that, that ups, upswing becomes quite vertical, and, and the complication rate rises very rapidly. Um, and the complications are things like tightness of the joints, uh, tightness of the nerves, and, and nerve damage. And, and we certainly don't want permanent nerve damage uh, if we're doing cosmetic surgery, you know, so um, I know, you know, a patient might come back and say, but that's their choice. They can decide whether they want that or not. I think we also, we're, we're in a healthcare team together, me and the patient, and we need to come up with a solution that's as safe as possible. And in my mind, that's, that's sort of where that lies. But, but there's no clear cut answer. It really depends on the individual and the starting length. Ironically, somebody that starts at a higher height will have lower complications at the six centimeter mark than somebody that starts at a lower height. So the person who needs it the most, ironically, would be the one that will have the highest potential risk at a lower lengthening rate, um, number. Now, if there was a patient who said, look, Dr. B, I want to get max length, I want to get as tall as I possibly can, and I'm willing to do the thresholds you have in place, the six, six and a half on the femur, and I want to come back, for quadrilateral lengthening and do the tibia. Um, how would you stage the lengthening uh, um, of each bone segment? Would you say, hey, look, let's do it a year apart, or would you say a couple months is good? What's the ideal time frame in between the lengthenings? I think, look, I know, um, you know, the masters in the field provide, uh, and, and, you know, Dr. Paley is probably one of the, well, he is at the moment probably the prominent surgeon in the world in this field. Um, and he's got, got a whole, package set out how you can do a quadrilateral in a shorter period of time. In my simple hands, this process is brutal and, and the patient needs a massive amount of recovery, a massive amount of nutrition, they need uh, pain control, they need physiotherapy. It's not an easy surgery to get over and for that reason I would want to stage them as far apart as possible 
um, to allow almost full recovery in between surgeries. And that in my mind doesn't happen within a year. So, so I would think about 12 months would be a safe zone, if you will. Um, of course, that, that limits the amount of patients that will have it. Uh, that's fine. You know, I, I think we, we're looking for end result. And you know, if you're gonna embark on this sort of surgery, uh, you mustn't look at the short-term goals. You mustn't look at the short-term price. You need to look at the long-term goal and long-term safety because this reconstruction needs to stand you in good stead for the rest of your, your life. And in all likelihood, whoever is doing it is probably in their 20s and 30s, which means they're about a third to a quarter of the way through their life. So the biggest part of their life is ahead of them. And, um, you know, we're getting into the psychological aspect now, but a lot of people do this or inquire about this because of dating reasons or sexuality reasons. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, sexuality makes up a very short portion of our adult life. You know, the majority of our life we spend um, not looking for a mate anymore. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, um, it's just the sad truth of life, man. But uh, the, the reality is that the benefit of this surgery is going to be, um, you know, in a way you have to measure uh, the potential risk you're taking to the potential benefit. Uh, you know, uh, and I, I'm probably not expressing myself well, but, uh, but I think rea realistically, um, you know, as safe as possible, um, which means in my mind, probably separating them a significant time apart. Uh, maybe the absolute minimum six months or so, but definitely not shorter than that. Not okay. in my mind. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. And that's kind of like you said, it aligns with a lot of the top surgeons, what they say too, for safety. And I love your, your approach, safety first. That's very cool. Now, this is kind of a weird question that a patient asked uh, for me to ask you, and it's about feet size and their new height. So he was asking if he wears a size six and a half inch shoe, uh, you, shoes at his height of five foot eight, um, if he does quadrilateral lengthening and, uh, you know, achieves the five inches, can his six and a half inch foot size still handle his new six foot one height or does his foot size have enough surf surface area to handle the pressure when he's doing things like sprinting jumping and all these other biomechanical activities yeah it's a very it's a very interesting um question and uh i don't think a lot of people in the world have given it a lot of thought to be honest um i might make a wrong assumption here but uh the reality is we, we do not have the technology available to safely lengthen the whole foot to a new size. So, so considering that off the table, we have to accept that there will be a biomechanical disadvantage with a relatively smaller foot to a relatively longer stature. Having said that, we are meddling with that anyway with a stature lengthening in terms of the ratios between upper body, lower body, um, femur length versus tibia length, uh, height of the knees, um, length of the muscles, you know, all of these things come into play when we're talking about high level athletic performance. And, you know, I am of the opinion that, um, and that might be contrary to some of my colleagues in the field's opinion, that whenever we're doing a cosmetic lengthening, we are sacrificing a certain percentage of high performance athletic performance. You know, that's just a given. And especially if it's a stature, stature lengthening or a cosmetic lengthening. If it's a post-traumatic, it's a bit different because the muscles and the nerves were at that original length initially. Trauma destroyed that, but then you, you're just going back to what you were initially made to be. With stature lengthening, we're changing that fundamentally. We're actually going beyond what nature intended for that body to be. And that puts a lot of strain on nerves, muscles, and mechanics. So in a way, I think we're fiddling with that anyway. I think the foot size is the least of our worries, to be honest, if we are adding 10 centimeters to somebody's height. Dr. B, when it comes to complications, neuropathies, like you said earlier, nerve issues can pose serious impacts on post-operative fun functionality. And so if a patient experiences nerve irritation during their lengthening process, could this be a warning of mo a more severe problem that's gonna come up? And if so, what do you think it might be? Yeah, I think that is one of the danger signs that I use to, um, to alert me to the fact that things are um, potentially uh, in a danger situation. Um, so tingling, um, sensation, uh, what we call paresthesia, uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, now, I have to qualify that because a lot of lengthening patients get that anyway. 
to a certain extent. So what we're talking about is when that sensation doesn't go away, it's permanent, it's turning across into pain rather than just a feeling of, of um, abnormal sensation. That's when we really get worried. Now, we almost routinely give um, nerve modifying drugs, uh, something called Lyrica uh, or Neurica. Um, I'm not sure what it's known as in your neck of the woods, but it's a, it's a medication that we tend to give for um, phantom limb pain after amputation. So it's a pretty strong uh, modifier of the nerve related pains and things like that. Generally, we, we add that almost routinely, but if that doesn't control the symptoms, then I know we're in for a rough ride and we need to, to then look at the nerve as a limiting factor for our lengthening. We would then continue with our intensive physiotherapy and try and focus on nerve stretches and nerve mobilizations. Uh, the next step, if it doesn't improve, would be to slow down our distraction rate slightly. Um, of course, we can only slow it down that a certain amount before we run into premature consolidation risk again from the bones perspective. So it needs a bit of juggling and a bit of experience from your surgeon's side to do that safely. Um, and then in, in the, the real extreme cases, we might actually have the discussion that we may need to stop the lengthening uh, altogether uh, if the nerve really becomes a, a big problem. Um, having said that, on the femoral distractions, nerve-related issues are rarer than on the tibia. And generally, we haven't had the need to really stop a lengthen, lengthening based on nerve alone. So, so that is reassuring in a certain sense. What is critically important is that the surgeon who performs the surgery needs to see these patients at a regular interval. Not his nurse, not his physiotherapist, not his assistant. The surgeon himself should be involved in the treatment. I think that is sometimes um, in the business side of our field that, that falls by the wayside. I firmly believe from an ethical point of view that the surgeon who performs the surgery takes the responsibility and they should be involved in that treatment process uh, throughout. Yes, of course, we use our multidisciplinary team and we use, but in my mind, at least every second week, the surgeons should see that patient personally and do an examination, have a look at the x-rays, have a look at what's happening so that if something starts going wrong, that the person who's responsible can ultimately act on that responsibility and prevent further complications. So I think that's critically important. Another thing that patients are really worried about is de developing a pulmonary embolism. What type of prophylactic measures do you put in place to kind of ensure patient safety during the lengthening process? I think I'm gonna, sorry, I'm extending this interview a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, but I think I'm gonna take a bit of a step back and, and just uh, clarify two concepts because I've, I've seen that people often confuse the two things. There's, there's something called fat embolism syndrome and there's something called pulmonary embolism syndrome. And I think it's important to distinguish between the two. Um, the, the one concept, fat embolism syndrome, is a term that we use uh, for a condition that happens in young people that typically have femur fractures or femur osteotomies. And it can happen after tibial surgery as well, um, where the lungs struggle to deal with the inflammatory cascade that gets released by this massive surgery. In simple terms, we call it fat droplets in the blood. It may or may not be exactly true, but essentially there's a result of this massive surgery or this massive trauma that ends up constricting the little blood vessels in the lungs, and that is what we call fat embolism syndrome. This is typically treated by oxygenation, um, everybody is an expert on ventilation nowadays after COVID, so um, <laughs> it's basically respiratory support that needs to be given. And that is a very rare complication, but it is something we see from time to time. And it is something that can be deadly in individuals. So that is the one thing. And the way to prevent that is to not have the surgery. Um, that is unfortunately not something that is easily preventable. And we by the grace of God, go forward and hope that we never see that complication in its most serious form, because it can be deadly. Um, and, and that is, I think, something that people undergoing the surgery need to fundamentally understand that this is not a walk in the park. This is something that has risk attached to it. Even though you might choose the best surgeon in the world, we are genetically programmed to have complications or not. And to a certain extent, 
that is something that's out of our control. So that's the first one, that's fat embolism syndrome. If it's picked up early enough, we can normally support the patient through the process and they survive and they, they go on to live a long and healthy life. The other one is called um, pulmonary embolism or thromboembolism. And this is a related to blood clots that form in the deep vessels, the deep blood vessels in the lower limb or in the pelvis. And they come loose from, from that clot and they shoot to the lungs and cause a pulmonary embolism. And that's something that can also be deadly in its most extreme forms. And this is something that we see a little bit more commonly, and it's certainly associated with hip and knee replacement surgery. Um, it can be associated with um, limb lengthening and especially bilateral limb lengthenings. And um, yeah, the, 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 the percentage rate is quite low, but if it does happen, it is quite severe. In my practice, I um, encourage active mobilization as soon as possible. So day one after the surgery, we kick the patient out of the bed and we get them up and going. It might not mean full weight bearing, but it will certainly mean movement and mobilization. And that's one of the ways to prevent that. Another way to prevent that is through drugs. And we use routinely uh, low um, molecular weight heparin, something like Clexane, um, initially in, in the hospital. And then beyond discharge after hospital, we use a similar regimen than what they do for hip and knee replacements, uh, which is a newer drug called Xarelto, which we do for a month afterwards, which generally covers the patients for both the first and the second peaks of potential um, uh, thromboembolism after surgery. Um, but I think that is quite important to, to cover them for about 30 days after surgery with some form of medical intervention for thromboembolism. Sorry, long-winded answer for a, for a <laughs> No, I, I think that's very important that you did uh, distinguish between the two, fat embolism and pulmonary embolism, because a lot of these people, they don't know what that means, but um, they're both worrisome complications, even though the percentages are low. Yeah. But the fact that you could explain that like that and you have prophylactic measures in place to keep their safety at top of mind is going to be very, very helpful. Now, Dr. Burkholz, you're very passionate about lengthening technology that helps your patients achieve their lengthening goals and fix their problems. Now, with lengthening devices like the fit bone and precise internal nail, this can be done minimally invasive. Um, in your expertise, which of these two nails is more reliable at lengthening? And I don't want to get you in trouble with the companies, but you're free to speak here on my channel. So go at it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm free to speak. I don't get paid by any of those companies uh, to promote the nails. So um, full disclosure, I have been on uh, educational contracts for both of these companies. Um, and uh, with Orthofix, the foot bone makers, I am on... Um, uh, 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 consultancy agreement uh, for uh, the external fixation products. So just to, to put that out there. But, um, but yeah, so I'm not getting paid to promote any, any nail or any, any device, and I don't really want to get in there. Um, since I'm not getting royalties, I, I, don't, I don't want to put my neck out. Um, the, the reality is that both these devices are good devices. I think both of these have um, a really good track record. I think the foot bone, not I think, the foot bone has been around longer. Um, it has been around uh, in Europe for a, actually quite a long time, since 1997, I believe. Um, but it was only available to a select few surgeons, and it was very um, tightly controlled who could use that, and they had to have very specific training and so on, which I think in a way has served the nail and the product very well, because it was only really done by experienced surgeons. On the other hand, it hasn't made it very popular and very well known. Um, it's only recently that it obtained FDA approval uh, formally. And for that reason, it's only been available in the States more recently. Um, the Precise Nail, obviously a newer product, but it's had a wider marketing um, drive. And in a way, um, that has also been its downfall to a certain extent, um, as we've seen with the uh, stride and with the temporary withdrawal from the market and so on. So both of these have their, let's call it peculiarities. From a perspective of just finding a nail that works, both of them work very well. Both of them are reliable products. And you know, if done properly by the surgeon behind them, um, they will work well. Think of it like a hammer and a nail, you know, that you that you build a cabinet with. You know, the hammer you use and the nail you use is probably less important than the cabinet maker that holds the hammer and holds the nail, right? 
Um, and, and this is the same analogy. I think the surgeon behind the tool is probably more important than the tool itself, to be honest. And that surgeon needs to understand that tool very well and be able to use it. Now, to, 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 to come back to your question, um, in my hands, I've done more precise nails than fit by nails, simply because precise has been more available to me in the past. I am quite excited about the foot bone in the sense that it is made from a stronger material and presumably that would allow better weight bearing capacity. That is offset again by the fact that it only has one locking screw at the bottom, um, which as opposed to the precise nail, uh, you know, so in a way, in my mind at this stage, it, it's, it's a two horse race and these two horses are pretty much equal. Um, so if I had to have a cosmetic lengthening, I would find it very difficult to choose between the two products. And I would probably leave that up to my surgeon to decide. Okay. All right. So, you, so they can do the job equally the same. So the patient probably won't notice the difference. I think so. I, I think in reality, that's probably where we are uh, okay. at the moment. Very cool. Now, like you mentioned earlier, with the recall of the stride nail due to the corrosion issues, um, a patient actually asked about the fit bone. Does it also have the risk of having a corrosion issue, possibly causing osteolysis, or does the material makeup of the fit bone not make this an issue? The short answer is I simply don't know. Um, and I, but I'm not aware of any osteolysis complications in the fit bone. As we've heard, it's been around for a very long time. Um, since 1997. So presumably if there would have been issues like that, and it, it was made in Germany at that time, um, I, I believe it's still made there. Um, you know, so you can imagine, uh, no disrespect to the Germans, I'm from German descent as well, but you can imagine that if there was a problem, they would have picked it up very quickly and stopped the, stopped the nail. So in a way, I think that gives me reassurance that it's probably okay. But like I said, I honestly personally don't know whether there is a problem like that. I don't know. I think the, the weight bearing concept of the nail is a big thing for, for most people out there. Um, you know, that's probably the biggest thing out there at the moment is, you know, is the nail weight bearing? How much weight can you take? Um, you know, I'm going to be running very soon if I have a weight bearing nail versus I'm going to be wheelchair bound if I don't have a weight bearing nail. I want to dispel that myth. I think the reality is we're breaking both your femurs um, surgically, but we're breaking them. Uh, we're putting a thick you know, 12 millimeter, 13 millimeter rod down the middle of the, of the bone. And then we're pulling it apart slowly to make you taller. Um, I don't think anybody can walk on that normally very soon after that sort of surgery, right? That is painful. It is a big operation. So in my mind, the, the, the focus should shift away from whether it's weight bearing or not to whether it's a functional uh, product that allows you joint range of motion and functional mobilization. So yes, it would be fantastic if we could all go running on our nail on day one. But the reality of the matter is none of us will do that because of the pain involved and because of the massive surgery involved. So what is more important is to have a physiotherapy team that will guide you safely through the process post-operatively and get you up and walking. So even though I'm not using weight bearing nails, my patients are out of the bed on day one and they're exercising the knee, they're exercising the hips. When they are ambulating, they're not putting their full weight on the, on the nail because they're offloading on the walking frame. Um, and yes, it's not the same as walking on, a, on your legs normally, but it's certainly not to say that you're gonna be in a wheelchair doing nothing for three months. That, that is simply not true. Another question that patients had about the fit bone, what diameter sizes does it come in? Is it just the 11 millimeter and the 13 millimeter? Yeah, the standard standard ones are those. It's an 11 slash 12 and then a 13. Um, so they're pretty thick and, um, you know, they're strong. So, so of course, that, that helps in the weight bearing sort of argument to a certain extent. Um, the reality is the fit bone was also designed with two concepts in mind. Um, Professor Baumgart, who, who designed it, um, basically used it for femoral lengthenings in a retrograde fashion. So, so he would insert it from the knee side. And you know, for those of you who've looked at the anatomy, the, the, the femur does taper down distally, so it becomes wider at its bottom. So for most patients, you would be able to get a fairly thick nail in there if you went from the bottom up versus from the top down. Um, so that would allow a thicker nail to be fitted into the femur quite safely. 
Um, and then secondly, the reaming of that nail is done in a way that you're creating a hole in the femur that corresponds exactly to the shape of the nail. That's where the name comes from, fit bone. It fits exactly into the bone. So, so in a way that, that has paved the way to get away with slightly thicker nails than we see, for example, with the precise nail. Um, having said that, that is a limiting factor in some bones where we can't go down uh, to smaller diameters. I believe there are custom sizes down to a nine millimeter diameter available, but you know I haven't seen those in my environment. So uh, I would probably look at you know using one of the smaller precise nails if the patient has a narrow diameter, or if he's really small, I would probably go and offer a distal uh, a retrograde insertion where we go from the knee up, um, because there we could probably get a thicker nail in even in the smallest canals. And that's with the uh, the precise or the fit bone you're talking about? Precise or the fit bone. Okay. You can use either of those nails in an integrate or a retrograde fashion. Um, there is a concept concept out there that the precise is integrate and the fit bone is retrograde. That's also nonsense. It's a choice of the surgeon to decide whether I'm implanting it integrate or retrograde. It's just traditionally the people who have done most of those nails, yeah. uh, the foot bone has been people who have been trained by Dr. or Professor Baumgart mm -hmm. to do it retrograde. Uh, precise, I think most of us come from the ISKD school right. where, or the BET school or the G-nail school where we used integrate um, uh, nailing. So <laughs> in a way, the surgeon will choose uh, the approach together with the patient and, uh, you know, it can be done integrate or retrograde or retrograde. Wow. I didn't even know that. That's amazing um, information there. And does it cause any other um, issues going uh, retrograde or is it like to the knee? Um, is it like a sub patellar approach? What, what exactly, how do you uh, insert it? Where, where are you enter entering from? Generally you, you line it up to the anatomic axis of the, of the femur, which exits just medial to the midpoint of the knee. So if you imagine a line coming down your femur, and it passes just on the inside of your patella, uh, that's about where it exits the knee. So you would have to insert the nail from that point. So that means if you feel on your infrapatellar tendon, that tendon that attaches your patella to your tibia, um, the entry point for the nail would be just to the inside of that in most individuals. So we would miss that tendon and you would come in from the bottom. It sounds horrible to, to go through the knee, you know, because you know, you know, we can't, we shouldn't go through the knee because we're destroying everything. The reality is that is actually a very benign approach because we're not splitting any muscle. We're not going through any nerves. We're really just going through skin and some subcutaneous tissue and fat. And then we're right in the knee joint and we can protect the rest of the knee joint quite, quite well while we're inserting the nail. So it's actually a very minimally invasive technique in a way. Um, whereas when we come from the top, we go through the abductor muscles of the hip. So if you lie on your side and you lift your leg up to the side, you're using your glutes and your glute medius muscle together with some of the smaller muscles there to lift your hip to the side. Now, those muscles are the ones that we go right through with a very big drill to actually get an integrate nail in. So if you look critically at a lot of patients that have had um, femoral nailing and specifically cosmetic lengthening, if they do a single leg stance, they stand on two legs and they lift one up, you'll see that pelvis start sagging. And that's something we call a Trendelenburg uh, sign, which means that you've got weak abductor muscles on that hip. Uh, and a lot of patients have that as a result of having had big nails stuffed through their um, abductor musculature. So yes, we do it all the time and we take that risk and so on. But it's not really true to say that a integrate nail uh, does less damage than a retrograde nail. I think they both do damage. They just do different types of damage. And I think it's important to understand that, you know, you have to choose what, what is going to work best for that specific patient. Absolutely. I did not know that. And I think that's a big, big, huge highlight of this interview right there, because I think that yeah, and out of all the interviews that I've done with surgeons, I never really asked about the integrated versus retrograde approach and the benefits and downsides of each. So I'm glad you brought that up. Patients are going to love that. For a, yeah. for a, for a surgeon that's trauma trained, an integrated nailing makes more sense because we do it all the time in trauma. That's how we fix femoral fractures in the majority of cases. So from a technique perspective, it comes naturally to us as surgeons. Whereas a retrograde nail is a little bit more cumbersome, a little bit more difficult to set up and so on. So that might be where the bias lies. 
But anyway, that's a, that's a topic for a different discussion. Uh, Dr. Burkholz, when you're reaming the intramedullary canal of the femur or the tibia, what exactly happens to the bone marrow? Because there's been a lot of, you know, debate about like, you know, you regenerate the bone marrow versus it comes back with a different type of material. You as an orthopedic surgeon, does it regenerate after removal or, you know, uh, the removal of the implant or does it fill back in with a different material altogether? What happens to the bone marrow? <laughs> yeah, I think... Hell, the, these questions all have uh, complicated answers, don't they? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or I make it too complicated, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> no. But um, I like thinking about things properly. Um, when, when we talk about bone marrow, it's important to define what we mean. Um, bone marrow, in the medical term of bone marrow, means a organ that's situated in the middle of the bone that forms blood cells. And, and that that is in the bone cavity and it, it sits there and it forms new blood cells. And if you think of somebody having cancer, having to have a bone marrow transplant, that's what we're talking about as a blood forming organ, if you will, that is situated in somebody's bone marrow, or in somebody's bone cavities. Now, in a growing child, that is all over the skeleton. It's in the whole bone structure. But in an adult or a young adult, um, that changes so that the bone forming component of the bone marrow only really sits in the flat bones. So things like the scapula, the pelvis, um, and right at the end of the long bones. So the, the biggest part of the bone is really just filled with fat. Now, that fat is what you and I know when we go to a restaurant and we eat a fancy steak with bone marrow sauce on it. That is what that is. So that's the fat inside the long bone. Not human, hopefully. Um, <laughs> But, but that, that is essentially what we're talking about. So that, that's really just fatty tissue that sits in the long bones of an adult. And whether that's there or not has absolutely no consequence to, to whether the bone functions, heals, or anything like that. What is important is just on the inside of the, if you think of the bone like a pipe, on the outside, you've got a little um, covering, which is called the periosteum. And that is important for bone healing from the outside because it carries blood vessels. But then similarly, on the inside of that pipe, on that cavity, on the surface, there's something called the endosteum, which is also full of blood vessels, full of nerves, and is important in regrowth of bone. Now, to a certain extent, by inserting a nail down the canal, we are destroying that endosteum to a certain extent as well. And there have been animal studies where they looked at re-establishing re the endosteal blood supply. And it looks like in the majority of cases that does come back after about 30 days, even in the presence of a nail being in there. So I think the question is not so much about bone marrow as it is about endosteal blood supply, which is important because that's important for regenerate formation, for bone growth, for lengthening and so forth. I see. That is an amazing answer. Thanks so much for that uh, answer. Because I mean, literally everybody's like, oh, it grows back. And I, I've been saying that because I don't know exactly what's happened, but that helps a lot. And I guess, you know, we wouldn't really absolutely know until somebody gets a biopsy after the removal. Um, and who wants to go back in to get that done after they get their stature lengthening? So. <laughs> Very cool. Um, now, the next question I have for you, Dr. B, is one of the most important aspects of limb lengthening, and that is physiotherapy to ensure the patients, you know, their soft tissues can adapt to the lengthening and recover from the whole entire process. So can you talk about the benefits of physical therapy and how many times a week, you know, minimum should a patient actually seek rehab, um, you know, after lengthening? Yeah, I think um, starting with the benefits, I think it's absolutely critical that physiotherapy should be a routine part of any form of lengthening and specifically cosmetic lengthening because as we said earlier we're going to supranormal levels we, we're stretching beyond what nature intended for that limb so uh, so we need to make sure that we stay ahead of the curve i always like to say that i as a surgeon implant a device that actually lengthens your bone but you as the patient together with your physiotherapist will lengthen the soft tissues um, so, so that physiotherapy process is what lengthens the soft tissue and the soft tissue is what gets us into trouble. That's not the bone. So, so in a way I pass the responsibility back to the patient, um, saying that the physiotherapy is going to be what's going to determine how far we get with your lengthening. Um, so to put it simply, more is better. So if a patient could have permanent physiotherapy, that would be fantastic, but nobody can afford that. And I'm sure the physiotherapist wouldn't love that. Um, I think it's important in my mind, the physiotherapy is also not something that the patient can take responsibility and hand it to the physiotherapist and say, you're in charge of my physiotherapy now. So you're in charge of, 
um, stretching and what have you. That's not true. The physiotherapist is purely there to monitor the process, to guide the process, to make sure that we're on track, to provide that safety net. But the real hard work gets done when the physiotherapist is not in the room anymore. And that's when you continue with the stretching exercises, you continue with the, con with the conditioning exercises, you continue looking after yourself while the doctor is not there and the physiotherapist is not there. You cannot give that responsibility to somebody else. If you're not committed to be doing those exercises day in, day out, those stretches, even though they may hurt um, in your lonely little hospital room or your lonely little hotel room, then the surgery is not for you because the success is going to deter be determined by that. That's going to determine the success. And the physiotherapist is purely there to monitor that process and to guide you along the process. But they cannot be there 24-7. And, and, and that is going to be important. Now, it's also important to have physiotherapists that have your best interest at heart and that have experience with us. Um, in the um, Institute for Orthopedics and Rheumatology, we're very lucky to be linked to a group of very advanced physiotherapists that normally look after high level sports um, uh, athletes. So you can imagine what that does to their ability to look after muscles and nerves and because they're dealing with high level athletes on a daily basis. So the goal is really high and um, that's what we try to aim for, right? We want to get this patient back to high level activity, whether it's going to the park to kick a ball with their kids or whether it's going to a high level mountain bike race or a uh, sevens rugby match, whatever it may be. So, so the beauty of the Institute is that we have that linked in. That's part of the package that we offer our patients is that um, the Stellenbosch Academy of Sport is the academy that's, that's affiliated to the Institute for Orthopedics. So, so our physiotherapists are really high level. They're really good at what they do and they push the envelope. I actually have to pull them back sometimes and say, look guys, we're going too fast. Let's, let's slow down. Um, and and that, that's sort of the environment that you want to be in yeah. um, where they push you really hard and they energize you to go through the process because that's so important. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. And I think that that's one of the most important aspects that we talk about is physiotherapy, but I can't tell you how many patients who've reached out to me and they're like, will I recover to be able to get back to my athletic, my athletic ability. And you just said, if these, the rehab center that you have there in Stellenbosch is working with high level athletes, and then it's going to cater to these patients, you know, firsthand. So that's amazing. Truly amazing. Um, now, Dr. B, although patients love to know about the surgery, your surgical approaches, the rehab, yeah, it's all fun and games. The biggest thing that they want to know is about the big financial investment that this surgery has. I mean, you know it. It's a cosmetic procedure, so insurances won't cover it. So if you can, mention the cost of cosmetic stature lengthening at your clinic and what your package includes. And I, I don't want to say package, but, you know, the services include. No, it's, it's always a difficult one. And, um, you know, good things come at a price. We all know that whether it's a bottle of wine, whether it's a meal, whether it's a car, you know, whatever, you know, I think I would again answer this in a complex way. Um, firstly, this is not my core business. This is not the only thing I do. I do orthopedics. I do limb reconstruction, which means people who are get damaged from other reasons. So the cosmetic part of my practice is a really small part. And it's an important part. It's dear to me for the simple reason that those are some of my happiest patients. Um, weirdly enough, um, <laughs> you know, you would think that if you take a person that doesn't have a discrepancy, that doesn't have a deformity, and you break both their legs and you make them taller and you charge them a lot of money for it, that they would not be very happy. But they are some of my most satisfied patients. And that's the reason why I've circled back to starting doing this again because I, for some time I had some ethical, you know, I still have some ethical questions in my mind sometimes, but the point is that I think I can provide a safe alternative. Um, and I'm saying a safe alternative because the price point I'm talking about actually puts me in reach for a lot of patients who would otherwise end up at some maybe less reputable surgeons that might do harm. And I'm saying it very carefully because I don't think any surgeon in the world intentionally does harm. Um, but unless you have experience with a surgery, um, unless you have a team around you, I don't think it is correct to charge somebody money to try and make them taller because it is really high risk surgery that comes at a 
high level of expertise that's required. Now, let's get all of that out of the way. Um, my package, if you want to call it that, um, comes in at about, not about, it comes in at 50,000 US dollars. So that... <laughs> Yeah, look, I could just say it right there. They're gonna love that. But go ahead. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not trying to rip anybody off, but I also need to make it um, sustainable for me and my team. So, so that's where that price point comes from. The vast majority of that price goes into the nails and the hospital, um, you know, and looking after the patient in a safe way. Um, what that typically includes is all my my costs. The um, cost for the anesthesiologist, the cost for the hospital, the cost for the nails, the cost for the physiotherapy, um, the wheelchair, the walking frame, the crutches. It covers a week in the hospital and it covers two weeks in the rehabilitation unit. Now, the rehabilitation unit is like a mini hospital, but it's more focused on rehab. So it is typically a rehab unit that's also geared towards spinal injury patients or old ladies that break their hips. So, so they try and get people back to function, um, you know, through admitting them, feeding them properly, and then giving them physiotherapy, occupational therapy, psychology um, support services throughout. So, so that includes that sort of, let's call it in facility component. Um, so that would cover the first three weeks. Um, that $50,000. Um, beyond that, it becomes a little bit fuzzy as to what a patient might require because our requirements are all very different. And if somebody wants a higher end accommodation, then it would be more expensive. If somebody wants lower end, then it would be cheaper. So, so that's why I've limited it to those first three weeks, which basically takes us from the surgery to the first distraction phase to the first two week follow up beyond that. And um, at that point, the majority of the physiotherapy would be established, uh, the majority of the pain control would be established, and the patient would be able to function in a, let's call it a normal Airbnb type of setup. Um, so, of course, there are options to extend the stay and all of that, but, but you know, the package in my mind should include the vast majority of the medical costs and the initial phase of rehabilitation. Beyond that, of course, rehabilitation needs to continue. So physiotherapy needs to, to continue beyond that, but that would then be structured as an outpatient um, visit to the physiotherapists. And, um, you know, that would be on a, uh, like they say in, in mobile phone terms, pay as you go terms, right? So you would then sort of pay, pay as you go along. But, uh, but in broad terms, I think the vast majority of the cost gets um, captured in that first quote, if you will. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's phenomenal. For one, your price is very, very competitive among the market for somebody so experienced as yourself. Um, but it includes a lot. I mean, you get like that top world class physical therapy team, you, your surgical team for a week in the hospital. I mean, most places discharge you within three or four days. So it's really impressive what you're doing there in Stellenbosch. So amazing, amazing stuff. Now, what if you had a limb like discrepancy or a deformity and, um, they're an inter international patient who's coming to see you. Do they need South African domestic insurance or can they use international insurance? How, how does that work exactly? That is very dependent on the insurance company um, involved. Uh, we do generally through the hospital, we do accept um, most reputable international insurance companies. They would need to provide us with a letter of guarantee, um, and if it is a reputable company, you know, then, then that would be fine. Uh, we've dealt with TRICARE from the States before. We've dealt with BUPA. We've dealt with uh, International SOS. Uh, we've dealt with MSO. So, so some of the bigger names in the field um, we, we have had dealings with. We've been lucky over the years to treat a lot of the uh, U.S. embassies, military and paramilitary personnel um, through TRICARE. And um, so we've built up a bit of a... Um, a knowledge of how to deal with them and uh, yeah so so in a way if there is international insurance generally it's not a problem as long as it's not for cosmetic reasons and as long as it's um, you know um, done in advance and properly through the channels then generally that's that's not a crisis south african insurance would be difficult because they normally have lockout periods and things like that so it would be very difficult for an international patient to get adequate uh, insurance in time to cover them for a local procedure 
Um, but also, you know, the rand dollar exchange rate is quite favorable. And, uh, you know, generally um, people also sometimes sell fund uh, operations like these. Well, Dr. Bertholtz, um, you're an experienced surgeon, caring orthopedic surgeon who, you know, basically gives hope to your patients by treating their deformities and even, you know, helping them boost their height on a daily basis. So for all the prospective patients out there who just fell in love with you after watching this awesome interview, um, how can they reach out to you? What email, website, how's the what's the best way of, to contact you? Yeah, I think the, the easiest is um, through my website, um, that is burkholz.health. Um, really easy to remember, uh, really easy to get to, um, just as long as you spell my surname correctly. <laughs> it's, it's a difficult spelling, so I guess we'll put it in the notes somewhere. But uh, Absolutely. yeah, burkholz.health, that's the easiest yeah. one on there. There's a link to the email address that's manned. There's telephone numbers in there. Uh, the address of the hospital is in there. Mm -hmm. um, that email address is manned by my uh, PA, uh, Tessa, okay. who's, who's, who's a great lady. She's got vast experience in dealing with international patients. Uh, she generally acts almost like a concierge uh, for my patients in a way <laughs> um, to give them some extra support and so on. So, so she would be the person that they would be dealing with mostly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think that that would be the easiest um, email address is uh, also also pretty, pretty easy. But I think the easiest is to go via the website. Everything yeah. is there and it should be easy to, to get hold of us. Perfect. Well, I'll make sure to put that uh, below the video. So all you guys who want to reach out to Dr. Burkholz, you can do that by clicking the link in the description below. Um, Dr. Burkholz, any final words that you would like to say to your new fans or anybody who's considering doing limb lengthening with you? I think I think the biggest thing is is don't believe all the hype. Don't believe uh, what the salesmen tell you. Um, do your own research. Make sure that you get to the right person, um, and that right person is not necessarily me. I'm not trying to sell myself, um, but get to the right surgeon. Get to a surgeon to whom you can ask the questions to, and they would respond honestly. I think that's very important. Um, lengthening a limb is very easy. Preventing and, ma and managing the complications, that's where the difficulty and where the art and the skill comes in. Um, and, you know, Victor, you probably get a lot of requests on your channel from people who've had complications and, you know, wanting advice and so on. So, so, so my plea would be research your surgeon properly. Make sure you get to somebody that has the experience, that has the ability to pick up complications, prevent them, treat them properly. And, um, you know, there's, there's this old adage, you, you, you can't have something done quickly, cheaply, uh, and well. You can only choose two of those three. So you can choose cheap and quick, but then it won't be done well. You can choose uh, quick and well, but then it won't be, you know, cheap or whatever. You know, so, so you can only choose at any given time two of those three. So, you know, this is unfortunately surgery that would cost you a certain amount of money to have it done properly. And if you don't have that amount of money, don't skimp on it. This is your health. This is your function that you're playing with. Um, then my advice would be try and find the money somewhere. Good luck with that, by the way. But, you know, we're all trying to do that. But, uh, but, but really, don't skimp on your health. Don't try and save money um, because this is really important. Your ability to walk, your ability to function, your ability to look after your kids uh, one day. I mean, that, that's a big thing to gamble with. And that would be my biggest plea is to do it safely. Um, don't come to me. That's not the point. Go to whoever can do it safely for you. Guys, you heard it there first. Safety first by the great Dr. Burkholz. All right, everyone. That is Dr. Franz Burkholz at the IOR of the Mediclinic Orthopedic Hospital in Stellenbosch, South Africa. Dr. Burkholz, thank you so much for your time. See you later. Thank you. I really enjoy interviewing surgeons like Dr. Burkholz, who not only explain the why behind his surgical approach, but also the pros and cons behind others as well. But with techniques, bone length, and devices aside, he still prioritizes the most important aspect above all else, safety. If you're interested in reaching out to Dr. Burkholz for a consultation, you can find all of his contact information in the show notes. Until next time, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, signing out.